Okay, let's begin. So, welcome everyone. I'm Nicola Elliott Wang from the H3D Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to host these webinars. Um, today, we're in for a real treat. Yesterday, when I had our check in with um, Dr. Olawale Salami, I was quite moved by some of the concepts that he was uh, sharing with me. So, I'm looking forward to all of you having that experience. So, I'm going to introduce him now. Dr. Olawale Salami is a seasoned researcher and medical professional with over 15 years of experience in developing new therapies. Currently based in Antwerp, Germany, uh, sorry, Belgium, he leads a global team focused on bridging preclinical and clinical drug, drug research. His work supports both emerging and established biopharmaceutical companies in clinical development, risk mitigation, and the design of first in human trials to assess the sa safety and efficacy of no novel therapeutics and vaccines. Previously, Dr. Salami served as medical director as, at Exavir Bio in Ghent, where he oversaw the clinical development of a pioneering nanobody-based monoclonal antibody targeting a unique region of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. His extensive background includes roles at the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in Nairobi, and the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics in Geneva, contributing to the WHO treatment guidelines for pediatric HIV and acute febrile illnesses. Dr. Salami has authored over 30 peer-reviewed publications and serves on the College of Experts for the African Research Excellent Fund. He holds multiple advanced degrees, uh, including an, ex an executive MBA and a doctor of medicine and has received prestigious awards, including the Marie Curie Fellowship. As a mentor at Morehouse University and the H3D Foundation, he actively shapes the next generation of clinical research leaders. Um, Wally, we're so thrilled to have you with us. Um, with that in mind, with after ha having given that introduction, I'm just going to hand over to you and to say that, of course, there'll be our usual Q&A at the end of the session. Um, and uh, so please stay tuned for that. Over to you, Wally. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Nicola, for that uh, really kind introduction. And uh, I want to also th say thank you to the H3D Foundation for providing an opportunity for me to share my thoughts uh, on this interesting topic. So over the next uh, one hour or so, we will discuss uh, this topic. Uh, which is starting with the end in mind uh, on key considerations for first in uh, man clinical trials. And the goal at the end of uh, this webinar would be to, to provide a pathway for you to understand how to move from bed uh, to bedside with your molecules uh, with minimal uh, challenges. So, if we could all just think of the molecules uh, that you're working on. So I know some of you are working on either one or multiple molecules, and you could envision 10 years from now, where do you see uh, that molecule positioned uh, in the landscape uh, of therapeutics for the disease that you're working on? So this is important to, to, to get a sense of uh, how it is that a molecule moves from the bench to the bedside and becomes a, a drug uh, in that specific disease area. Uh, so the, the, the webinar will be divided into uh, the following sections. So first we will talk about the, the target product profile and then we go through uh, a short introduction into first in human trials uh, and then uh, a bit uh, into preclinical safety, uh, starting those selection and uh, then we move into uh, study design considerations and then after that we will discuss a bit about safety monitoring uh, and then close uh, with uh, biomarker assessments. So uh, for most of you, most of the audience uh, who are in the academia, you have survived peer review. Uh, so now let's see if a compound can survive uh, the human body. That's where the rubber uh, meets the road. Now first, uh, we will look at what, what, what is a TPP. Uh, so as you work on your molecule, you uh, have an understanding of 
what's the ideal characteristics of uh, a, a therapeutic uh, product or prophylactic products in, in that disease area should be. So it's it's very critical to define this really, really at the start, uh, knowing what the current standard of care is, uh, what are the current met needs, and what are the priorities for patients uh, at that current uh, at that time. So uh, indication is important. Certainly, you your molecule will be uh, you're working towards a specific disease. But even within uh, the disease, you have a target population that is uh, perhaps the one that is uh, with, with the highest or met needs where you would like to provide a solution. Uh, then furthermore, you want to define very early what the goals of FEKC are uh, really based on uh, the, 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 the current available treatment. And FEKC. Uh, benefits can be derived from your molecule. Uh, the is to also look at the safety profile, what is acceptable, uh, so what is the balance that you would like to take, uh, you know, if you have a treat, if you have a disease where there's no treatment uh, available, perhaps there might be some tolerability for uh, some uh, adverse, event, uh, adverse events uh, uh, compared to an indication where you have available treatments where then the threshold uh, for, to for, for tolerance for, uh, for for adverse events is, is, is much lower. Uh, then certainly you would also want to check the dosing and administration. And so what dosing form, uh, if you're looking at children, want to go for uh, something that's palatable uh, in that population. Uh, if you're also looking at if you if it's targeting patients who are hospitalized, perhaps uh, a parenteral out might be might be best. So it's important early to determine how your molecule will be administered uh, to the patients, even while you're working uh, in, in you know in, in defining your TPP. Uh, but of course, differentiation is also important. How will this be different? What additional benefits will the patients derive from your molecule when it becomes a product? Uh, then this then brings us into the next part, which is our introduction uh, to first in human trials. So you've been working on your molecule in the lab for a couple of years. And now you think it's ready to go into humans. It's it's a three moment. Uh, it's because it's a major milestone in drug development. Uh, so this is the first time a molecule will interact with the human body, and so this leap of faith uh, is very crucial, but a necessary one. That tests uh, all you've been doing uh, for maybe a decade uh, or five years or a few years, depending how long you've been working on that molecule. The real test is when you administer the first dose uh, into humans. Uh, and we know this is a really, really complicated step in drug development. So in this slide, uh, you will see in the middle uh, bar that the, the highest risk in failure is actually at the phase one level when you're doing uh, the first administration to humans. And uh, uh, we will then we will talk a bit deeper into this as to why you have uh, such a high failure rate at, at, at this at this stage uh, when the drug uh, into humans. But from a risk perspective, this is really the key step. But if done well, can really open up uh, the the probability of success for the molecule. Uh, so here, this uh, the so this. So on the right, you will see the locations geographically, geographically where a lot of the first in human trials uh, are conducted. And uh, as you can see in the middle of the graph, that there is very little first in human trial uh, uh, activity in in Africa, and for so many reasons, uh, which. We will leave for a different discussion, but we, we do have a major, major unmet need uh, in Africa, uh, and we need to uh, work towards uh, having more first in human trials uh, with, because the experience then allows many of you in this room 
to 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 become more confident to move your your, your molecules down you know the, the the pipeline. So I think the summary of it is there is a major major gap uh, in in the, in the African continent uh, regarding first in human trials. Uh, on the on the left you will see the therapeutic areas where a lot of these first in human trials uh, are conducted. So uh, as you see on is the top uh, therapeutic area. So a lot of the first in human trials out there are conducted uh, in the oncology indication. So uh, safety, safety, safety. I think safety is one of the main issues why uh, drugs fail uh, at this stage at first in human level. And in order to mitigate this, there, there is uh, there, there there are lots of preclinical safety tests that will be required. So as you're thinking of taking a molecule into humans, uh, the guidance from the regulators will be important uh, for you to uh, to understand what preclinical safety tests are required before you can file for a clinical trial application to conduct your first in human test. And so we'll go through these tests uh, in the next couple of slides. So uh, the regulatory guidance uh, is, is, is clear, but also evolving as new molecules, uh, new, new drug classes uh, emerge from the labs. So currently uh, the, M, the ICH uh, M3R2 provides uh, the core safety evaluation expectations for first in human trials. So the tests that are in the R2 version of ICHM3 are important uh, and they're customized to the drug class uh, that you're working on. So, uh, for biologic specific requirements, then the reference uh, regulatory document is the ICH uh, S6R1, while for anti cancer pharmaceuticals, uh, first in human trials is the ICH S9. But ultimately, the goal of preclinical safety testing is to really tease out, uh, based on the profile of the molecule, uh, what are the organ-specific toxicities that we should anticipate uh, in humans. Uh, this could be, you know, it, it those related to drug exposure uh, or not. Then there is also a... Uh, uh, the second goal is to, to look at both on target and off target effects and to be able to, to anticipate uh, what potential off target effects we are likely to find uh, uh, in, in humans when we administer the first dose and put, put in measures to, to mitigate this uh, if, we pro if we decide to proceed uh, into humans. Uh, thirdly, it's to determine uh, the relevance to human safety because there is no direct, there, there, there are uh, correlations, but there's no direct relationship between what you find in testing uh, and preclinically uh, for safety compared to what you will find in humans. There could be, uh, uh, there could be, uh, you know, there could be flags that you can uh, you can latch onto. You can say if we find this, then it's likely to uh, to be reflected in humans, but it's not it's not necessarily uh, a linear relationship. Uh, in, uh, so furthermore, the preclinical safety testing will help identify uh, biomarkers that could be used to predict uh, safety events uh, uh, in humans. Importantly, the, the type of therapeutics is important. So the, the, the reference for safety testing for small molecules is different for biologics. So the guidance has been tailored to the different uh, molecule classes. Uh, so like I said, there's some uh, there's some requirements for by therapeutic types, for example, small molecules, uh, genotoxicity uh, is, is, is very relevant as well as uh, acuity assessments for cardiac safety. Uh, but while for biologics, uh, it's it, it, it's more focused on non rodent species uh, because of the very uh, you know, more similarities uh, in, 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 in the mechanism of action and on, in the PK uh, and elimination of, of, of these uh, molecules compared to humans. 
but there are really core safety protocols, for example, toxicology, uh, understanding the maximum tolerated dose and no adverse effect levels, as well as dose ranging. So those are core uh, preclinical safety protocols that uh, are not related to drug class. And then uh, also safety for ecology is important. And for some molecules, also photo safety uh, is, is required if these drugs can trigger uh, pho uh, phototoxicity uh, as parts of the clinical picture in patients. So this, uh, you will get this slide. So this uh, is a table that just gives an overview of the different uh, uh, preclinical safety tests that are required. Uh, and so uh, I tried to put everything on one slide, but it was quite difficult. You will get the slide. So here the summary is that there are tests that are required to establish uh, safety. Uh, based on the pharmacokinetic parameters and also pharmacodynamic parameters uh, of your molecule. Uh, there are safety tests that are required if you are from, from a single dose and dose range finding uh, approach, as well as from a multiple dose, uh, more dosing approach. The summary of this is that all the, uh, all the possible risks in humans uh, have to be explored preclinically uh, before the first human doses uh, are applied. So we will then look through uh, the next critical stage in first two human trials is selection of your first, uh, your starting dose. How do you determine what dose to, uh, to give in your first two human trial? This is a very, very uh, complex uh, process. It's, it's, it's quite complex and I would try to provide this overview, uh, but there's lots of work out there uh, that is still emerging on fine-tuning the, the starting dose in a first in human trial. So the, the key objective uh, in the work that is done to select your first dose is to define what initial dose range uh, perhaps based on preclinical results uh, and any relevant human data uh, based on making, uh, you know, your, your, the MOA of your molecule. So, but it's important that it's a balance between the risks and anticipated therapeutic benefits uh, uh, for that dose. So it's a, it's a dynamic process and requires uh, sometimes a bit of iteration uh, so, but most importantly, you want to have a dose where your your, your balance of risk is is low, toxicity risk is low, uh, while being able to derive uh, you know pharmacologic uh, activity. And sometimes it's a range where you can start from. So for each therapeutic for each molecule, we know that the optimal dose is somewhere within the range, and then we have to find. The, the sweet spot that allows therapeutic benefits uh, with minimal uh, toxicity risk. And so there are guidelines from the EMA uh, and also from the FDA that provide uh, and, uh, recommended approaches to, uh, to dose selection. And uh, those are listed uh, in, the, in the last two bullets. So uh, in summary, the EMA guidance focuses more on clinical to clinical uh, transition as risk mitigation. Uh, and then in addition, the FDA uh, suggests using the benchmark uh, of NOIL uh, as a safe starting dose and uh, drawing from tox uh, data. So there are generally two approaches. So we have the empirical approach, which uses the, the limits of the no adverse events level, and then with allometric scaling for a maximum uh, safe dose. Uh, the pros are it's the, the, there's a lower risk of toxic toxicity, uh, but on the other hand, they might miss the pharmacologic dose uh, and doesn't really address dose escalation very well. While the other approach, uh, which is more fa uh, favored by the EMA, is a mechanistic approach, which you which mainly uses uh, preclinical uh, pharmacological data with uh, ex vivo and in vivo studies and uh, uh, models where applicable. So the regulatory frameworks uh, give a structure, but these are also adaptable. And uh, these discussions will need to start early 
uh, you need to start planning early as to what it's your anticipated starting dose for first in human application of your molecule. So this uh, schematic just gives you the two primary approaches. So when you have, uh, when you need to do an interspecies scaling, uh, either from a, uh, from a rodent uh, to non-rodent or from, for, for, or from non-rodent to humans, the two main approaches. So is it a, uh, what we call the physiological based uh, PK modeling uh, or an allometric scaling? So these are the two uh, commonly used approaches for interspecies uh, scaling uh, applicable to spore molecules. And the uh, ICH S9 guidance uh, provides more detail, uh, it's really related to anti-cancer therapy where you don't have this linear relationship, especially with the new generation of, uh, of, 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 of molecules. Uh, so there are also modifications in allometric uh, scaling that can be used. For example, the rule of exponents, uh, liver blood flow correction and uh, in vitro metabolic clearance correct correction uh, modifications. So for biologics, uh, so for example, antibodies, it's, it's a bit more complex because there's several char uh, characteristics uh, like polarity, charge, molecular size, which then uh, impact the, the first dose selection uh, uh, calculation. So the, the, the el elimination of, uh, of the biologics are mainly by renal excretion or from protulitic degradation. Uh, so, uh, allometric scaling methods could be effective due to conserved processes across mammalian species. Uh, but then, if you look at formalcolon antibodies, you have other models uh, that are also based on non human primates, which are uh, very common, commonly used. And so, either linear or non linear PK approaches uh, are used. But it's also important to look at the local delivery concentrations in the target tissues. Uh, when you think of your starting uh, dose in uh, with 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 um, with antibodies. Next, we will then have a look into the study design because this is uh, how you will deliver your um, your first in human dosing and all the approaches uh, and and generate the clinical data. That will that will provide uh, the evidence of safety uh, of your molecule. So typically, from a design uh, perspective, uh, so typically it's a it's a blinded uh, placebo controlled uh, approach, and the cohort sizes uh, uh, are usually, you know, six, eight, ten kind of uh, sizes. Not 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 more than ten. You don't you don't have Court sizes uh, more than that, uh, and then you know the, the, it's usually a three to one or four to one active placebo kind of randomization, and the primary focus is really to detect uh, safety signals. Uh, at this time, you're not checking for your proof of concept. You just want to evaluate: is this molecule safe to administer uh, to humans? And the sample size uh, is important. So your ability to detect the event is determined by the court size, event rate, uh, and some of the other parameters related to the mechanism of action uh, and how easy it is to detect um, the safety events in, in patients. So there's so many complex calculations into this, which are beyond the scope uh, of, this, uh, of this webinar. But just know that generally court sizes, uh, you know, increase from one to six, and um, so placebo inclusion is is is, is important. It's maybe it's maybe not so much in oncology, first in humans, but for all other indications, uh, placebo is important to really really tease out if the safety event is driven uh, by a molecule or it's, it's related to some background. So this is these are some of the key uh, considerations when you're designing your first in human trial. Then, of course, we're always using healthy subjects, but in some cases, you might use patients for first in human, not commonly in oncology, yes, but primarily healthy subjects 
uh, uh, the population that um, so that we can really we we have a background we have a threshold and any event that is uh, safety related can easily be uh, you know be teased out uh, you know because these are healthy subjects uh, uh, in, in in all parameters so uh, so yeah we also try to because they don't have any background illnesses comorbidities then events that are related to the drug are easy to detect. Uh, in many instances, usually a, a male with non-childbearing females, uh, but there's now a push by uh, based on uh, recent work that it's, it's critical to think of including uh, females uh, as much as males in these studies as early as possible. Uh, in order to look at some some you know some some parameters that are more critical, uh, especially in women of childbearing age, where if you're looking at you know molecules, for example, that target malaria in pregnancy, and you want to have a deep understanding much earlier, so there is uh, a lot of work in tailoring the 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 population to be to to more closely reflect the population of patients that will benefit. Uh, from that molecule ultimately. Uh, so dose escalation, like I said earlier, the your 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 dose that's you know the the, the dose that goes into phase two is somewhere within the range. And so uh, it's it's the approach is to start from a relative a relatively uh, safe dose and then you escalate uh, with within uh, you know, you had you escalate until you reach uh, a dose that is, you know, that that elicits safety uh, adverse event. Then we can stop below that dose. So there are several uh, methods to do this: uh, sequential dosing with observation periods in between. Uh, we always use a sentinel dose many times. Uh, it's important that you have uh, you, uh, your first two. Doses you have randomization one sentinel and uh, uh, you know one sentinel dose uh, active and placebo just to see if there are events that are triggered that could put a stop to those in subsequent healthy subjects uh, and when this is safe and everything is is clear then you can proceed with those in uh, the rest of the subjects in that court and then the same approach is taken uh, as we escalate uh, to the next dose. So it's a balance uh, of safety and defining the correct dose. Uh, we try to push to the maximum exposure, but not necessarily. So the approach is really driven by what you anticipate in the patient population. So there are, of course, regulatory guidance uh, that tries to uh, limit the speed with which we can uh, escalate. So escalation should be uh, should not be too slow, but should should be really planned uh, in a way that does not expose the subject to unnecessary safety events. So there are several rules, uh, those finding designs, for example, a three by three design, a model based adaptive Bayesian design, which are very common uh, in oncology. But the ultimate goal is we want to identify a dose uh, that, can, that we can take either into a phase one B, uh, you know, proof of concepts in the same protocol or into a phase two. So um, other design considerations are the single ascending dose slash multiple ascending dose slash adaptive approaches. Like I said earlier, today it's the the the, the most uh, efficient approach is to combine them. You have a single ascending dose, uh, uh, and then when you have an interim analysis, or then you can go into multiple ascending dose, and then uh, based on that you can have a court you know, of patients as part of the same protocol. So again, these are ways in which we want to accelerate the drug de development process. Instead of having three protocols, we can have a combined uh, approach. Uh, so in order to, to move things faster. Next, we will go into uh, safety monitoring for first human trials. Like I said, safety, safety, safety is the main goal, and there are uh, approaches to how we monitor uh, safety events in first in human uh, trials. First, signal detection. Uh, the small sample size that we use in uh, first in human trials means that 
uh, the, the probability to detect these events uh, is, 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 is low, but um, if you are able to deserve, uh, you know, to determine causality, then, uh, you know, really it, it, it then tells us what to anticipate if we are, if this drug moves into, uh, uh, you know, the larger population. So I think that the data that's collected is, is robust and includes physical exams, vital signs, lab assays, uh, looking at possible hemotoxicity, liver toxicity, uh, nephrotoxicity, uh, and then an ECG for, for cardiotoxicity. So we want to establish that once we dose this drug, I mean, this molecule, that there are no toxic, uh, you know, toxicity that can be assessed uh, uh, clinically. For some molecules, uh, they could be uh, autotoxic and or, uh, you know, some molecules are toxic to the eye. So we check uh, based on what we anticipate, based on preclinical testing. So cardiac safety, as we know, is, is fundamental. So there's really a special focus. Uh, ECG monitoring sometimes continuous throughout uh, just to detect if there are changes in, in the contact contractility uh, of cardiac muscles that could mean you know, we don't proceed with this drug uh, into patients. So local reaction is also important. We also check uh, for local reaction at injection sites if the drug is administered uh, either subcutaneously, uh, intravenously or intramuscularly. And uh, adverse events of interest are also checked uh, if this is due to anticipated uh, events in the class of, of that molecule. So uh, in summary, I think determining the maximum tolerated dose as well as the uh, adverse event management is, is critical. So we want to know, we don't want to, would, I mean, if the drug is too toxic, it will never be successful in clinic. And so that's the stepwise escalation with, within courts. Uh, it's, it, it's important that this is really, really uh, well managed and well calculated. Uh, so it's always important to like to have at least the courts of the patient population as part of first and human where feasible to uh, because the adverse events that you find in healthy subjects or the safety signals may be exacerbated in patients. So it's good to already anticipate what this means when we have patients uh, dose at first in human level uh, based on the design and based on the disease that you're targeting. Uh, so low risk, high risk, uh, 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 a monitoring approaches. So really the, the robustness of the monitoring is driven by the what we anticipate based on preclinical safety testing uh, and also based on the, the mechanism of action of the molecule and the target tissue uh, where we expect the pharmaco uh, dynamic effects to be uh, mediated. Now, uh, we're almost getting to the end uh, of our talk. And so the last part, we'll look at uh, biomarker assessments uh, because the safety of uh, a molecule may not be obvious. Uh, through clinical tests and through some of the, uh, you know, laboratory assays that I have listed earlier, but there could be changes that uh, can be monitored uh, as, as 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 a way to predict safety events. Uh, so through biomarkers, so uh, the the biomarker assessment is very very uh, fundamental to first in human studies, and. From a pharmacodynamic uh, perspective, some of these biomarkers could be the key ways to to assess the efficacy, and so it's good to start to collect them uh, as early as possible. So uh, we can already be begin to to collect this data at at, at the first human stage, uh, and then uh, and then collect more in the proof of concept stage. So think of your molecule and think of what biomarkers are critical uh, to, to, to test uh, or to monitor the, 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 the efficacy in patients and then to, uh, to assess uh, 
uh, safety risk uh, in healthy volunteers. So this is important as part of your first human uh, strategy. So the development of your assays to uh, to measure these biomarkers is, is also important. These assays have to be reliable and uh, validated such that by the time we go into the larger patient population, then we can rely on these biomarkers uh, as a way to to assess um, uh, you know the the, the 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 effects of of your molecule. So the method development and validation is think something you should also think through uh, at the at the beginning. And from a regulatory perspective, there are guidances on how uh, your biomarker uh, should be. Uh, measured and how it's validated. And so these are built into your first human design, uh, but, uh, or at least considered early in the, in the development stage. So um, now we've reached the end of my talk. I would, uh, this in, 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 I would like to conclude by uh, saying that, uh, you know, consider these critical points of uh, safety monitoring, how will you monitor safety events uh, in the first in human trials? Consider what the ultimate patient would look like and if you can already have some of these patients as part of your phase one uh, trial uh, in, 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 in a hybrid design where you have a you know, first in human single ascending dose, uh, multiple, and then you have a cohort. Think of regulatory requirements that guide the, the, the product uh, class that you're working on. Uh, think critically of the design that you would like to adopt and how many healthy subjects uh, you need per cord. And biomarker selection, what biomarkers would you like to select and carry through to, uh, throughout the development stage of your molecule? And importantly, ensure that all the required preclinical safety studies are done uh, prior to application for a clinical trial. So uh, it's always something to expect. So I always expect and expected, no matter how much we, we plan, there will always be issues. Uh, but I think the trials is, is uh, you know, seeing the finish line uh, in the first in human trial, uh, it's, it's actually only half of the journey. There's still a lot more that is required downstream. So uh, be prepared uh, and always expect the unexpected. So uh, like we started, I wanted to go back again, uh, think through the molecule that you're working on. Uh, and based on the discussions uh, we've had in the last uh, half an hour or so, how, where does your molecule sit in the landscape? And where do you see a molecule 10 years uh, from now? Uh, do you see a pathway for a molecule to make it into uh, patients? So uh, I want to say thank you uh, for listening uh, and to thank the organizers for inviting me to this talk. So uh, please stay in touch uh, on LinkedIn and we can, uh, so you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. So thank you very much uh, for listening. So I think now we have quite some time uh, for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Salami. That was really, really fascinating. The floor is now open. Um, if anyone, please raise your hand um, and you, you should have the unmute function available to you. But just to kick us off, you know, a lot of um, younger researchers will be thinking, uh, you know, what are the key moments in your career uh, that, that took you to where you are now? And um, maybe you could reflect a little bit on that for us. How would somebody who's looking at your career go, yeah, I'd like to follow that kind of a path. What sort of opportunities might they want to look out for? Yes, I think for me, one of the most critical parts of my career was when I moved, when I made the switch from clinical medicine into, uh, into bedside uh, immunology, working at the lab of Professor Benjamin Maslin uh, at the University of Lausanne uh, in Switzerland. And a lot of the preclinical testing work, uh, some of them I've done personally myself uh, in the lab, uh, in models, in, in mouse models. So that was uh, a, a part of my career that, that 
opened me uh, my understanding of how to move a molecule uh, uh, into humans and understanding the risks that are involved. And you can see some of these risks when you conduct the preclinical test uh, uh, in, 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 in rodent species. So uh, and then being able to translate that into my current work uh, with the background of the understanding of what could potentially go wrong when we administer this first dose. So I've, I've been I've been fortunate to have those opportunities uh, to be able to have uh, insights into different parts of my career. And if you can look ahead into the next maybe five or ten years. Um, without sharing anything in confidential, but what do you think is next? What what is the field going to be generating, um, in particular for you and for your interests? Uh, so I'm very passionate about drug development, especially in 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 Africa. So I would love to see more projects uh, in by African scientists in collaboration with scientists from other other parts of the world that are moving product developed in African labs. Uh, into patients. Uh, so I I foresee a future where African scientists are testing uh, molecules in Africans developed in African labs, uh, such that we're able to balance uh, the global uh, the global scenario where currently the current status is that a lot of this work is done in high income countries and only clinical the um, only late stage work uh, is done. In Africa, so I hope to contribute in some way to 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 you know to shape in this uh, to balance in the future. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, you've sent through a recommended paper. Could you speak a little bit to that paper, uh, just to give a bit of context to it? Perhaps I've put it in the chat for everyone who's wondering. Yes, so I think it's a nice overview uh, paper where it really looks at. It's an introductory paper to first in human trials, so it's a recommended paper for anyone who is looking towards, um, uh, you know, in-depth understanding of how, what are the next things you need to prepare as you position your molecule uh, for possible application um, uh, in, in patients. So there's a lot, it's a very wide, wide field. Uh, there are lots of sub-specialties, especially in the regulatory science part. Uh, you have a lot of self-specializations in the different uh, preclinical safety tests, but it's good to have that broad overview and know who is doing what, what are the things I need to anticipate, uh, and who are the groups I need to connect with in order to, to find resources to be able to do some of these tests, because cost also could be a limitation uh, for some of the, uh, the emerging scientists who, who want to uh, to do all, you know, to be able to 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 de-risk the molecule uh, with all these safety tests. So I think it's a it's a nice starting point. I would say. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm going to go to one. Ah, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk. I think it was quite uh, engaging. Uh, could I ask, since you mentioned uh, some experience with uh, translating? Uh, rodent toxicology to uh, fast in human trials. How have regulators traditionally viewed um, situations where you see uh, rodent toxicity, but you don't see that in other species? Is it just it's a lower species, therefore disregard it, or is it dependent on what that is, what the margins are, or other mechanistic factors? Yeah. So uh, Matthew, I think that's that's a very very critical question and. Um, indeed, when we look at the, the you know the the dossier of preclinical tests that some of the biotechs would like to submit uh, for first in human trial application, we do indeed see that um, for some uh, molecules where you you may have uh, you know you may have toxic you know you know safety signals in in rodent. And then it's you know you don't find anything in non rodents and vice versa. But I think the rule of thumb is the closer the species is to humans, then the more likely the risk would uh, also be present in humans. So if you find a if you know toxicology data in mice, uh, you have some signals, but you have either rabbits uh, or you have dog or you have uh, you know or, or porcine 
talks toxicology and, and that looks okay, then you know it might be justifiable. You can justify to regulators and say we did not find anything, uh, you know, in, in dogs and, and in, in pigs, and we will put in we we'll put in place, even though it could still happen in humans, but we will we have A, B, C, D, E uh, strategies to mitigate that. So, for example, like the sentinel dosing, uh, like the calculation of your first uh, your starting dose. So you really want to lower. Uh, you starting those to be a bit more comfortable uh, and then to specifically look out for those adverse events. Uh, so once you put that together, you can justify that uh, and the regulators will be comfortable, especially if there is if it's in the class that the unmet need is significant. So we know the regulators want to encourage you uh, to bring your product if you have a very, very critical need and patients. So it's a lot of discussions back and forth between uh, you know, the developers and, and, and the regulators. I hope that answers your question, Matthew. Yes, it does. Thank you. There's a question from the chat. Um, thinking about clinical trials for pediatric drugs, what are the ethics around recruiting children for such studies? I think super important. This is too super. I, I was I was hoping someone would ask this because indeed you have you have uh, you know, diseases that are purely in the pediatric population. Uh, so you, to do a first in human trial in, in pediatrics requires a very, very strong justification. But we've seen cases in, in specific pediatric cancers where there's no treatment, where, uh, you know, starting first in, in the patients. So these are patients uh, with life-threatening uh, pediatric cancers for which there's no alternative treatment. So in that scenario, yes, going directly into children for first in man, uh, of course, with, with a strong justification and risk mitigation strategy in place uh, is allowable. So it's, but if there is no, that the, the justification must be strong and the need in children uh, must be such a critical need, then, uh, then going first in children uh, could be justified. Thank you. I'm going to, there's still a little bit of time for more questions. If any want to come through, I'm going to ask one final question. I know you are a mentor, you're a mentor for us and for others. I'd love to know a little bit about what that's like for you. What are you getting from it? Um, and what maybe have been the surprises of that, of, of mentoring in general? Um, so I think from a perspective of interac interaction with younger scientists, uh, at PhDs uh, or postdocs were trying to uh, carve a niche uh, in, 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 in drug development space. What I see challenging for many of them is access to, to resources, uh, access to labs with, 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 with assays that they, that they need uh, as part of the experimental plan. Uh, so being able to know where to go, uh, being able to also get feedback on their design uh it's something i've seen that uh, some of them have uh, had as challenges so i think the responsibility is 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 on some of the more experienced scientists to guide the younger ones to to be available uh but most of the time to connect them with uh with the resources that they need uh to answer some of the critical experimental questions that that, that they would have so this is my this has been my experience uh, so far with H3D as well as with the with the team at uh, Emory University. Okay, um, if there are no further questions, um, Wale, do you have any last comments that you'd like to leave us with? Yes, I think the key comment is start early, uh, and. Uh, find the teams that have you don't need to have everything uh, you don't need to have all the resources the resources out there uh, if only you would you know just think of uh, find those labs reach out to them you need to do uh, a preclinical toxicology tests uh, specific to your molecule reach out to those labs uh, so but the, the most important thing is to start early and have a plan and always iterate that plan uh, and then, yeah, so talk to those who are more experienced in this space uh, and uh, and yeah, but it's it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy, but 
but yeah, we hope some of you scientists will, will, will keep pushing through and we want to see more uh, new chemical entities emerging uh, from African labs. I think that's a fantastic ending to our session today. Um, Dr. Salami, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your passion and your real heart-centered approach that is coming through in the work that you're doing. We, we so appreciate it. Thank you. To everyone listening, thank you for joining. And um, there's always that invitation to give feedback, uh, which I've put in the chat. So feel free to send us your ideas. Um, I'm currently in the process of setting up next year's program. So I'll be looking at that um, at that form to get ideas for that as well. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a wonderful Wednesday. Bye. Thank you. Bye.